Just 30 minutes outside of Victoria, the Saanich Peninsula is one of Vancouver Island's best kept secrets. Astounding beaches, natural landscapes, and hardworking farms all make up this hidden gem. And from beasts to brews, fantastic gardens to great food, I'm off to celebrate the richness of the region with the Greater Victoria Flavor Trails. Welcome to Country Wool in North Saanich. Lori Thompson is a renowned sheep expert and travels throughout the province tending sheep and shearing for other farms. She raises local lamb alongside up-and-coming farmers Alex and her baby son Simon. Well hi Lori, thank you for having me at Country Wool. Nice to have you here, yeah. out in the pasture. <laughs> out in the pasture. Obviously we have a ton of different sheep around us. No goats. Sheep. No goats. No goats. goats. Sheep. Sheep. Yes. Oh. You're either a sheep person or you're a goat person. You can't be both? Mm -hmm. Not me. No. Most sheep people are sheep people. So what kind of sheep do you have? All kinds here. This one's a Rido Arcot. This one coming here? Yeah, the Rido. Here. She she, <laughs> yeah, she needs to learn that you're you're a nice guy yeah, too. Come on. So the Rido was developed by the Canadian government. Um, oh, really? They're highly prolific. The wool is quite fine. You can see that. It's a sort of a soft wool, like yep. it's quite soft to handle. Yeah. This one is a registered fin right here. This, okay. one, this one was born last year. This one is a Charlet, born last year. Okay. Lori has over nine breeds of sheep on the farm, which she raises for their wool as well as their meat. She also makes her own wool products, such as mittens, socks, and toques, and sells spools of wool ready to be spun into traditional cowhagen sweaters. We head back to the farm for sheep shearing lessons. Although apparently I didn't wear proper clothing, so she lends me some new pants. Caleb has put on his, his working clothes there. My with fancy his, pants. With his fancy pants, with fancy his fancy pants. shoes. Do you want to turn this sheep over? I want, like, to, I want to see you, you do like it. Would you like me to show I a, you first? I need a demonstration. Okay. Please. So what I call this is, um, one of my favorite terms for uh, ter for uh, wrestling sheep for shearing is it's sheep shih tzu, which is a, sheep shih tzu. which is a martial arts involving sheep. But the first thing you're shearing is the belly wool. Okay. You want your shears right on the skin. Okay. Because you want to take it all off. Sheep martial arts is right. Lori starts at the belly, then makes her way up the rest of the sheep's body. And this the sheep is held in position. And the body is presented for shearing by the way you hold them. Kind of like for shaving. How do you do that so fast? Well, we don't want to be here all day. Lori's record for the amount of sheep shorn in one day is 135. Yes, 135. That's like 17,000 pairs of socks. Then we step in the middle. Yeah. And this is where we involve the little dancing with sheep, right? <laughs> so if you spend the whole day at it, it's a bit like dancing with wolves. It's a long, boring day. With the sheep's body held in position and with the animal totally relaxed, more wool is shorn from her hind legs, sides, and neck. Sheep begin being shorn at one year old. And in a breeding flock, the average lifespan of sheep is about 10 years. So an entire decade of these special haircuts. Shearing is important not only to gather wool, but also for the sheep themselves. The wool could impede breeding, and it also can impede the uh, lambs nursing. Oh, that makes sense, because they can't get in. Two layers of wool. You could yeah. end up with wool like this, like the ones that escape shearing in New Zealand. Yeah. Now, do you want to walk this sheep over to the gate? Sure. OK. Is she going to fight me too hard? I don't know. You're going to find out. We're going to find out, yeah. We're going to find out. If she's, uh, if she's liking you or not, hang on hard. Right. I gently guide the freshly shorn sheep to the gate. Remove the tether, and she's off. There is nothing like a fresh haircut. Thanks for the lesson, my woolly friend. From shearing sheep to brewing beer, I find myself at Howl Brewing. Howell is an independently operated pico brewery 
which means they're even smaller than a nano brewery. Their focus is on small batch, high quality craft beer made from BC grown ingredients. They love to play with beer styles that may be considered obsolete, beer that showcases local farms and traditional styles, and they're not afraid to experiment. I'm here to make some beer. First step of beer making is grinding the grain. Yes, milling right. the grain is the first step. So uh, yeah, if you want to do the honors. Uh, All right, this is my toggle here. Yep, yeah, just it turn just... it on and then start pouring away. Start pouring it in. Mm -hmm. This malted barley is 100% BC grown. The finicky process of beer making has already begun because you don't want to grind the grain too much. You want to crush the, the grain with not too much flour and um, uh, not too big of chunks. You just want enough for area, surface area for, for the water to, uh, to uh, so just kind of, evenly, yeah. So it's kind of like that, it's eh? It's a mixture of a little bit of both, right? The next step brings us inside the brewery. What is this thing? What do you call it? What's your real time. name? Mash tub? Mash time. All right, so mash time, we're mashing in the mash tub. Yep. So we're okay. adding uh, we're hot doing... water and uh, we're adding grain. And we wanted to, to end it about at 150 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. So that's uh, the right temperature that it will rest and it, it will be the best for protein to start conversion. So you're going to pour, I'm going to start? Yep, for sure. All right, let's do it. So basically we're just making like a giant cauldron of soup. Yep. Dan pours and I stir. He pours and I stir. He pours and well, you get the gist. All right, this is definitely the hardest, biggest pot of oatmeal I've ever had to stir. Yeah, no kidding. I, I feel like you could probably get a machine for this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the beer rests for an hour and then it's time for sparging. So we're sparging, what's sparging? Sparging, well essentially we're uh, showering the grain bed and okay. we're, we're um, pumping from the bottom into the kettle. So the, the hot water comes from the sparge tank and it comes out this long arm here, which showers down on the grain bed. And then this goes into, into the kettle. The kettle is then fired up and then um, you, you boil the beer wort for a half hour pre-boil pre and then at that point you can start adding your, your hops or whatever ingredients you'd like. Um, if you're adding your hops, the beginning of the, the boil you're going to get more of your bitterness and later on in, in the, the boil you're going to get more of aromatic qualities. And then once you get the hops into the beer, what's the next step after that? So uh, after you're done adding your hops and your, your, your fruit or whatever other ingredients you'd, you'd like to add, then the beer is cooled and then the yeast is added and the beer is fermented. And then we have delicious Then beer. we have delicious beer. Amazing. After all that work, we head to their outdoor picnic area where you can order beer, snacks, fill up your growlers and even visit the local goats. Yeah, local goats. Beer drinking can't get any better than that. Well, so we'll, what do we got? What well, are we right now we'll start off with the beer, the same beer that we, we made today. So yep. this is a, from a previous batch. And those are local blackberries from Gobine Farms, spruce tips from Forest for Dinner, yep. and hops from one of the local regulars. Oh, and the spruce really comes through on the nose, hey? Yeah, like it's got a, like a citrusy, almost like yeah. a blueberry tea kind of uh, flavor. Yeah, I love how like you get kind of both the blueberry or the blackberry and the spruce tip mm. right off the top. Yeah. So this one's the uh, current saison, and the, the currants are from Silver Rill Berry Farms, which is just off of Stelly's Crossroad, and uh, the, the has uh, additions of uh, rosemary, local rosemary, and mint. Again, that color is stunning. Mm -hmm. Like, that's really beautiful. Wow. Mm. Well, that's like a perfect summer saison. I love that. Fantastic. Yeah. And then this one here is a, another saison with uh, rose and lavender and then strawberries from uh, Gobine Farms as well. It's such a, like a classic saison color, but like it really smells, it smells of strawberry. How do you do that to get the strawberry in without so the, the strawberry is uh, blended and then added at the very end of the boil. Yeah, okay. Sometimes I, I just kill the flame and then I add the, 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 okay. the berries and and I uh, whirlpool around too. So it doesn't extract the color, but you get all the nose and the flavor. You get a bit of the color, varying. but not, not too much. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. What a nice way to spend my day making beautiful beer. I love learning about how food and plants grow. And the Gardens at HCP teaches you just that. This stunning property is set in a conservation park with nature trails, wetlands and bird watching sites, and includes over nine acres of eye-catching gardens that are beautiful year-round. They host weddings, rent out meeting spaces, and are home to the Pacific Horticultural College. And among all else, they love connecting people with plants, and I meet with their head gardener to get a lesson of my own.
Linda, thank you for joining me and showing me your beautiful gardens. It's my pleasure. I'm happy to have you and let's hope the weather stays dry. <laughs> so you have a lot happening here. Tell me about the gardens themselves and what yeah. kind of different programs you have. Because yeah. it's a lot more than just growing things, right? Exactly. We are nine acres of demonstration garden. Basically, okay. if you were to come here for the first time, you could walk around and you could see anything you can grow in Greater Victoria, basically, is what we're showcasing. Really? We have a school here, a horticultural school, mm -hmm. where students take a 10-month program. Mm -hmm. We have probably 60, 70 volunteers that come in and volunteer their time in specific gardens every week. That's incredible. It you have is. That it's kind amazing. Of volunteer base. It's amazing. Wow. And also we have, of course, staff that look after it too. Yeah. But it's quite an interesting spot and it changes with the seasons. So any time of the year you come, it always looks different. What's coming up right now then? Right now we have tons of veggies coming on, herbs, mm -hmm. and everything else is really just at the peak of growing. It's sort of the peak of the growing season. I do recognize many of the herbs they grow here from my time in the kitchen, but they also specialize in indigenous herbs, which is what Linda teaches me about next. Well, this is our Gary Oak Meadow Flower Garden. Here we have a lot of things that are actually edible, like this salal has a berry that's edible. I don't know if you've ever done any cooking with it, but it's quite lot, tasty. Lots, actually. I definitely like, grew yeah. up picking and eating like salberry pancakes. I know, they're so delicious. Yeah. And again, a lot of things are just, you know, basically for medicinal, herbal uses. For sure, people will be more aware of native plants now because they want to grow them in their own garden because okay. deer tend to leave them alone. They tend ah, to be more deer resistant. I didn't realize that. Yeah, yeah, they tend not to chew on those as much as they do the lovely, you know, sort of more fancy types. And also, they uh, tend to be drought tolerant. Oh, so okay. this garden here has absolutely zero irrigation. Yep. In the heat of the summer, in the summer drought, we drag a hose in here yep. and water when we have to. But otherwise, they're basically on their own. Well, and that makes sense because they're in their natural environment. Exactly. Yeah. So they're used to adapting to that. For sure. Yeah. Now, it's a great spot to come and have a look. And it's quite interesting to see how many native plants we grow here. So we're in the urban garden now, Linda? Yes, we are. This is kind of one of my favorite spots because of course it's edible food. Yeah. It's veggies. I love it. Um, this garden, well, I'll give you a little bit of the history. It's basically, yep. I teach a course here where we teach students how to grow food. And I think more than ever, that's okay. more popular. Okay. Certainly we saw it with COVID. When COVID hit and people had to stay home, so many people turned their front lawn into a veggie garden. There's so much interest in it. I know. So you have students in the garden learning yeah, hands-on kind do of stuff. Some, they do actually some work online where they actually get sort of the, the basics of the actual okay. gardening first. Before you release them? Yeah, and then we release them into the <laughs> garden. So what we've done, we have 16 students, so I've basically put them in pairs. We have eight gardens. Yeah. And I give them kind of full range to choose what they want to grow. Really? So they get to pick and just kind of yeah, be free with me, it? Yeah, to me, if you should grow what you want to eat and not grow that's what someone tells you to grow just yeah. because, you know. Yeah, but I mean, totally. they're all really into it and they've all pretty much chosen really unusual different things and it's great. What are you growing now then? What's, what's going now in the garden? Yeah, so now we're into the heat lovers. Summer's okay. here, well, almost here officially. And we grow lots of tomatoes, we grow peppers, we grow basil, we grow all kinds of things that basically need that long, hot summer yeah. to Produce. All the peas, which are everywhere in oh, abundance. Oh, the peas are amazing. We've got lots of those. The other thing we plant a lot of, we plant edible flowers. Okay. We plant a lot of flowers to attract pollinators and to attract beneficial insects. Ah. So what we want to do as an example is nasturtiums, which are yep. lovely edible, but they're also an aphid trap. So if you have problems with aphids that. in your garden, you plant nasturtiums. That's the amazing. aphids just go on the nasturtiums, leave your other edibles alone and everybody's happy. Well, thank you so much, Linda, for taking the time to show me everything and yeah, make these beautiful gardens. My pleasure. In the middle of these beautiful gardens sits Charlotte and the quail, named after their beloved garden kitty, Charlotte, who adopted them six years ago. A restaurant truly inspired by nature, they love incorporating fresh garden flavors into their nourishing menu, including edible flowers. So tell me about the food at Charlotte and the Quail. I'm really curious about how it's inspired by the farm and how that kind of intersects in the restaurant. Yeah, well, the food is fully inspired by this garden. What we try to do is take what's happening out here and express it on a plate. Every morning we come out, we harvest flowers. We take a little moment to kind of see what's going on. And, and I think that that is actually everything. Yeah, yeah, that little really brief do. moment that of time to get... moment in time to like really look at the beauty of what's out here. We find a spot in the garden with some edible flowers to inspire Haley's next creation. Nasturtium. Mm -hmm. Have you had one of these before? I have. They're peppery. I'm happy to have another one, yeah. They're sweet, they're so delicious. I love them. Mm -hmm. And then there's these borage, which are so beautiful, and they're for courage. Mm -hmm. 
She picked some violets, mallow flowers, and some pea flowers. So these guys are one of my favorites. These are really more for savory dishes mm -hmm. or salads, but they're just so gorgeous and they add so much. Beautiful. And take the whole beauty. tendril, eh? The whole tendril. They may look too beautiful to eat, but we're gonna do it anyways. So we head up to make some flowery creations. So we're gonna make dessert, because what's awesome. better than dessert and flowers? I don't know. Can't not much, it. not, not much. The base of the dessert is a gluten-free oat crust, which Haley sweetened up with a rose and honeysuckle honey. And then this is our cashew cheesecake. So it's cashew and coconut um, filling, essentially, okay. with lots of berries in it. Yep. So we're gonna fill this one up. I've already done this one. I think you're taking the power on that. Sure, yeah. Yeah, I'm go for it. it. Fill it up, and then yeah. we'll decorate. Do it. Is there any specific way I should be doing this? No, or just, you uh, do you. How I see fit. Yeah. yeah. The filling is spread on the crust, and then it's time to start decorating. I always like to have a little green on every plate. Hey, you're going whole flowers. Oh yeah, I'm going for it. You're going whole hog, whole way. I'm definitely feeling a bit like an artist as our creations go from simple to gorgeous with more and more colors added based on our own inspirations. How do we know when we're finished our masterpieces? Honestly, I don't know, but at some point we just stop. Okay, I think this is amazing. Thank you. I love the way that you've taken the petals apart and the colors. Thank the colors you. colors are beautiful. It's right in my, I love those colors. Did that bring you joy? <laughs> it did. <laughs> Good. <Always. Yes>. Good. <laughs> and thank you for having me and showing me what you're doing here. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thanks for coming. The final stop on this flavor trail is at the beautiful Waterfront Inn at Laurel Point to visit Aura Restaurant. With over 200 rooms and suites within the Tubing Hotel, all with the water view of course, the inn is proud to support local as much as they can. The hotel had a large scale renewal in 2019, which added some unique new spaces, such as the new concept restaurant and outdoor garden. The garden changes with each season, as does their small plate menu. That's where I met Chef Ken. Hi Caleb, well welcome to the kitchen garden at the inn at Laurel Point. Thank you very much, thank you for having me here. Oh, you're it's very great. welcome, we're, we're pleased to show this off any way we can, anytime, anyhow. This is, this is stunning. Yeah, we have a little bit of herbs on this side. You know, we have our flowers that we use for many things for garnishing, mm -hmm. our berry patches over there. We're quite proud of the diversity of this garden and it's it's full all year round. We do so many weddings and events, so it's gotta be picture perfect. So we, we've all got, the time. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're we'll making sure that it's aesthetically pleasing. It's not only beautiful, it's bountiful. The culinary team pulls directly from the garden all year round to supplement their menu. There's our apple tree. It's just starting off now, and right behind there's the pear tree, rosemary, a few things like that. Understood. But we're really interested to plant in the coming months the citrus. Oh, we'll really? Have bergamot, uh, yuzu, sudachi. We'll have some persimmon. Again, by the water feature there, we'll have some grapes and some kiwi hanging. So there'll be all kinds of stuff. <laughs> so much happening. Yeah, there'll be a very diverse uh, garden for sure. And, and that'll just cycle all year, right? Eh? Well, and that's what's going to drive our menu. So, I mean, yeah. we'll be harvesting all year round, replanting all year round, and there'll be always be something interesting coming up and going. So we're very excited about that. That's The incredible. kitchen team for sure. I love that. From the plants to the plates, Chef Ken set up a special waterfront table for us to try some of his fantastic dishes. I like to consider myself somewhat of a VIP. That's a ton of food, Chef. Well, it's a small plates, so they're small. Okay, it's so, grazing. So. <laughs> so tell me what we have and tell me what these small plates, what we're doing here. Well, it's uh, a chance to kind of graze around a little bit and get a lot of variety in your, your meal versus the, the a la carte style. A lot more energy, a lot more interaction. It's a lot more fun way to, to eat. Uh, yeah. We can do some bolder flavors with these small plates. What we have here is some Yarrow Meadows duck breast, and we made some umeboshi with the local rhubarb that's just showing up now, so we paired those two together. Some umeboshi? What is umeboshi? It's, uh, well, I mean, traditionally in, in Japan, it's a plum that's uh, cured in salt and some shiso leaves. Okay. And that will be that way for a few months and then they dry it in the sun. So salt cured and marinated with herbs. Yeah, and it's preserved. So uh, it's essentially it's just a salt cured pickle. And that, that gives it a bit of an umami flavor, right? Yeah, like definitely. Down, kind of funk. A lot of our plates are umami based, so it goes well with sake. Uh, moving along, we have some Berryman Brothers pork belly. It's the chasu pork and uh, some of our garlic chives from the garden. Again, Beautiful. Yeah, those kind of things are booming right now, so we're using it. The yellow flowers are the kale buds, or the kale flowering. Uh, so sweet and just like delightful. I love it. 
It's the world's best piece of bacon. We have some uh, asparagus, just grilled asparagus with some Beautiful. soy cured eggs. The uh, eggs, we're, we're using Farm Hub. They're a local uh, distributor of... From around the peninsula too. Yeah, just like... all from the peninsula. I love that. What's next? Cushy oysters. We all know the darling of the West Coast, Settler yep. Bay is cushy oysters, but we've made some kimchi with our shard, garden shard, and uh, we paired that with a sake mignonette. So house fermented kimchi? Yes. On the oysters. Mm. That's a, almost surprising, but like, works beautifully. I yeah, there's that. a little bit of ginger and garlic. It's yeah, really needing a little bit of heat on there, so it's like... Just a touch to make yeah, it work. It's, yeah, it's, it's a, quite a uh, level up from the typical hot sauce. Mm -hmm. Here we have some halibut. Delicious. Tell me about the sauce that's on that halibut. That like pink sauce. What's in there? Uh, it's quite simple. Cherry tomato, a little bit of um, shallot, a little bit of garlic, mm -hmm. olive oil, some sherry vinegar, a uh, touch of salt, and that's it. I love it. Uh, we strain it, and then um, that, that's captures that, that fresh cherry tomato flavor. Tell me what the potatoes up there. So it's a steam crushed fried fingerling potato. Okay. But we, but we uh, made a salt with dashi. And then on top of it, you'll see the shaved bonito. I love the bonito, the bonito one there for your bravos. It's totally- It's a little different, Totally right? different, but yeah. it works very, very well. Well, part of our, mm -hmm. our uh, thing here at the end is, you know, a little something slightly different. You know, we're always yeah. trying to take something that's uh, local seasonal and maybe put our own little spin on it punch up the flavor or make it a little bit more sophisticated. And that's really easy to do with this smaller plates concept. And just when I thought there couldn't possibly be anything else. Is this more food? <laughs> We're like gonna bury in food, Caleb. You're trying to hurt me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on, this can't hurt you. <laughs> this is a lot. I love it though, it's so good. I'm gonna eat it. This is our blueberry ice cream cake. We have fantastic uh, desserts here too. That is absolutely beautiful. Very nice. Well, thank you so much for having me here at your redone patio for Aura in Laurel Point. You're very welcome. Come anytime. It's my pleasure. That's the end of this Flavor Trail adventure, and I can definitely say the pleasure was all mine. <laughs>